Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Phil Deerking and Anne Ball. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Phil Deerking. Zambia's government has denied that the country faces an economic crisis. Yet, many Zambians suspect that the money it owes China is reaching unsupportable levels. Amos Chanda, a spokesman for President Edgar Lungu, told VOA that while Zambia may have economic issues, it is far from a debt crisis. The economy is going at 4%, but that is not to say there is no economic problem. There are economic problems but you can't call them a crisis, Chanda said. He also denied reports that the Chinese companies were taking control of government property. There is no single Chinese company taking over, he said. Chanda noted that Zambia received a $30 million interest-free loan and $30 million grant at the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation. The meeting was held last week in Beijing. Concerns remain high that China is seeking what some observers call debt trap diplomacy, with the goal of taking control of Africa's strategic assets. One such example comes from the Africa Confidential website. It published a story on Zambia's national broadcaster, ZNBC, earlier this month. It said that the state-owned TV and radio news channel ZNBC is already Chinese-owned. However, investigative reports from local media show the reality is more complex. In 2017, another website called Tumfueco reported that the Zambian government and China created a joint project to digitize Zambia's broadcast services. It is called Top Star Communications Limited. The Chinese company Start Times owns 60% of Top Star, while ZNBC owns 40%. The company is overseeing the setup of about 1.25 million set top boxes throughout Zambia. The money it earns is being used to repay a $273 million Chinese loan for the project. Nick Branson is an expert on African economics and a doctoral candidate at the University of London's School of Oriental and African Studies. He told VOA that it can be difficult to know which stories coming out of countries like Zambia are true. While the government would not like to sell assets, he said, it is not in complete control of its public finances. He added that Zambia is struggling to control the debt it has built up during the past three years. China has long-standing relationships with political leadership in Africa. While such ties are often seen as a sign of China's loyalty to Africa, they often do more harm than good. That is because African leaders often use these connections to seek out projects that only help the wealthy class. These countries usually face few protests from opposition activists, the public, or China itself, Branson said. Governments with well-defined national planning documents have had better success negotiating good deals with China and paying off their debts. 
the more a country understands its infrastructure needs, the more negotiating power it has, Branson said. A lack of openness also leads to problems, he noted. Branson said that neither China nor African countries want the details of their agreements made public. Resource-rich countries like Angola, a longtime China partner, have been successful because they are able to export materials that China wants. That makes it easy for them to get loans from China. In Angola's case, that's trade oil for infrastructure loans. But for smaller countries, repayment plans can be difficult. For example, some African nations may struggle to repay billion-dollar loans for railroad projects that will take many years to pay for themselves. Branson says it is possible that China might seize African assets. Still, he says, African countries unable to export farm products or other commodities will likely struggle to repay their debt in the long term. I'm Phil Deerking. The American company Amazon.com is one of the biggest businesses in the United States and around the world. Now the company is said to be negotiating with the government in Chile on a plan to reach for the stars. The Reuters news agency reports that Amazon hopes to store and use information collected by huge space telescopes in the South American nation. Amazon is in talks with Chilean officials to store and mine what is called astrodata, information gathered by the telescopes. If an agreement is reached, the company may be able to use the information to develop artificial intelligence tools. Chile's government recently announced plans to combine data from all its telescopes and store it in a cloud computing system. This means the information would be stored over the Internet instead of a computer hard drive. The government has yet to provide details of the astro data possibilities. It did not say which companies might operate the computing cloud. Amazon has been talking with Chile for two years about a possible data center. An official at Invest Chile said such a center would provide services for local businesses and the government to store information on the cloud. American astronomer Chris Smith said the negotiations have included talk about the possibility of Amazon Web Services storing astrodata. Smith was involved in email exchanges between AWS and Chilean officials over the past six months. At the time, Smith was with Aura Observatory, which leads three of the U.S. Finance Telescope projects in Chile. Amazon Web Services' Jeffrey Kratz has met with Chilean President Sebastian Piñera. Kratz confirmed the company's interest in astro data, but said that, for now, Amazon was making no announcements. Chile is a very important country for AWS, he said in an email. We kept being amazed about the incredible work on astronomy and the telescopes, Kratz wrote.
He said the Chilean telescopes can benefit from the cloud by easing the difficulty of dealing with information technology. Northern Chile is known for having clear skies, not much rain, and large areas without bright city lights. This makes it a perfect place to observe the night sky. Because of this, 70% of the money spent on astronomy in the world goes to Chile. Many of the world's most powerful telescopes operate in Chile's Atacama Desert, the driest desert on Earth. Chris Smith said that within five years, three of the world's four next-generation billion-dollar telescopes will be in the South American country. Powerful telescopes produce large amounts of information about the universe. If a deal between Chile and Amazon is reached, AWS's cloud computing program could help. Economy ministry officials are leading Chile's effort to store astro data in the cloud. They said there are ways such data could help with more earthbound issues. One ministry official, Julio Pertuze, said tools developed for the astro data project could have other uses, such as identifying persons stealing goods from stores or helping to protect endangered animals. Pertuze spoke at an event announcing Chile's aim to build a virtual observatory on the cloud. Amazon's founder and leader, Jeff Bezos, is known for his interest in space. His company already provides a cloud platform for data from the Hubble Telescope and the International Center for Radio Astronomy Research in Australia. As Amazon explores the possibilities in Chile's astro data, another technology company, Google, is already a member of Chile's Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. It will be fully operational in 2022. Google also has a data center established in the country. Just last month, Cruz started work on the telescope at Las Campanas Observatory in Chile. The giant Magellan telescope is expected to give humans a view of the edge of the universe. The project will cost $1 billion to complete. The huge device will have seven round mirrors that will be 24 meters around. The telescope and its computer will make the giant Magellan telescope 10 times as accurate as the American Space Agency's Hubble Space Telescope. The Giant Magellan Telescope should be ready for use in 2024. Scientists hope to be able to collect more light than any telescope ever built. They hope they will be able to see all the way back to the earliest days of the universe. I'm Ann Ball. <laughs>
home values had been going up and up. Now the balloon burst. People started losing homes they had bought with money borrowed on easy credit terms, loans they were then unable to repay. The hope was that the crisis in the housing market could be contained and that it would not spread to the wider economy. Traditionally, local banks would have suffered the losses on the bad loans, but times had changed. Big investment banks had been buying those loans. The investment banks then resold them as securities offering high returns. Credit rating agencies working for the investment banks had told investors that the securities were safe. Selling a financial product based on a large group of loans was supposed to limit the risk if a few loans went bad. That was the idea. But that was before millions of homeowners stopped paying their mortgage loans. Mortgage-backed securities became known as toxic assets. No one wanted to be anywhere near them. In March of 2008, Bear Stearns became the first investment bank to fail as a result of the crisis. Others followed. In September, Lehman Brothers, the nation's fourth largest investment bank, sought protection in bankruptcy court. Its failure only deepened the fears in credit markets. Toward the end of 2008, an international credit freeze developed. No one wanted to take the risk of lending money to banks or other companies that might have owned toxic assets. Some people feared that there could even be a global depression, the first since the 1930s. The United States economy, the world's largest, started shrinking at the end of 2007. The unemployment rate started rising. President George W. Bush's administration, Congress, and the central bank, the Federal Reserve, took extraordinary steps to deal with the growing financial crisis. Their efforts included loans to banks, automakers, and other companies. The aim was to rescue businesses that officials considered too big to fail. The bailouts from Washington were a decision that not all of the American people agreed with. But the people also had to make a decision of their own in 2008. It was a presidential election year, and the candidates were some of the most diverse in the nation's history. The Republican Party nominated Arizona Senator John McCain. At 72, he would have taken office as the nation's oldest first-term president. So stand up with me, my friends. Stand up and fight for America, for her strength, her ideals, and her future. The contest begins tonight. John McCain had been a Navy pilot during the Vietnam War. In 1967, the North Vietnamese shot down his plane and took him prisoner. He was tortured and held for more than five years. He returned home a hero. During the presidential campaign, he spoke often about his experience as a prisoner of war. His campaign message was, country first. Senator McCain quickly secured the Republican nomination to succeed George W. Bush. The Democrats needed more time to choose a nominee. The race settled on two leading candidates. One of them was Hillary Clinton. Her husband was former President Bill Clinton. They spent eight years living in the White House. As First Lady, she held an unusually public role in her husband's administration. 
Later, she was twice elected as a senator from New York. Now she was trying to return to the White House, this time as the first woman president of the United States. So if you want a winner who knows how to take them on, I'm your girl. The other leading candidate for the Democratic Party's nomination would also make history if elected. He was a first-term United States senator from Illinois named Barack Obama. He was born in Hawaii to a white mother from Kansas and a black father from Kenya. If he won, he would be America's first black president. Blacks in the United States had been slaves until 1863. They were not permitted to vote until 1870. Women in the United States did not have a constitutional right to vote until 1920. And not until the 1960s did federal civil rights laws bar discrimination against either group. During the nominating fight between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, there was a lot of discussion and debate in America about gender and race. Some talked about the problems that women still faced in society and wondered whether Americans could accept a woman as president. Others talked about the problems that blacks still faced in society and wondered whether Americans could accept a black man as president. I think we're ready. Well, I hope we're ready. I just hear people comments, yeah, you know, that that'll be the day when we have a, a black man running our country, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm really not sure. Candidate Obama gave a speech about race in America. I'm the son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas. I was raised with the help of a white grandfather who survived a depression to serve in Patton's army during World War II, and a wild white grandmother who worked on a bomber assembly line at Fort Leavenworth while he was overseas. I've gone to some of the best schools in America, and I've lived in one of the world's poorest nations. I am married to a black American who carries within her the blood of slaves and slave owners, an inheritance we pass on to our two precious daughters. I have brothers, sisters, nieces, nephews, uncles, and cousins of every race and every hue scattered across three continents. And for as long as I live, I will never forget that in no other country on earth is my story even possible. It's a story that hasn't made me the most conventional of candidates. But it is a story that has seared into my genetic makeup the idea that this nation is more than the sum of its parts. That out of many, we are truly one. Many political experts predicted that Barack Obama would lose the nomination. For one thing, he was still new to many Americans, while almost everyone knew who Hillary Clinton was. Also, she had many wealthy supporters donating to her campaign. But political scientist Larry Sabato at the University of Virginia said those experts did not understand the country's mood. And they underestimated the power not just of Barack Obama, but also the yearning for change and the antipathy toward dynasty. The idea that the Bushes and the Clintons would essentially control the presidency uh, from 1988 to potentially 2016. Hope and change became the messages of the Obama campaign. Barack Obama won enough delegates to secure his party's nomination, which he accepted in August, shortly after his 47th birthday. His choice for vice president was Joe Biden, a longtime senator from Delaware. But Mr. Obama's nomination was not the biggest news story for long. The next day, John McCain had a big announcement of his own. His running mate would be Sarah Palin. 
The Democrats had once nominated a woman for vice president, Geraldine Ferraro, but never the Republicans. Neither party had ever nominated a woman for president. Sarah Palin was the 44-year-old governor of Alaska. Few Americans had ever heard of her until she spoke at the Republican nominating convention. She referred to herself as a hockey mom. I love those hockey moms. You know, they say the difference between a hockey mom and a pit bull? Lipstick. Some women said they admired her ability to balance work and family as the mother of five children. I feel like she really speaks for me and represents me. During the campaign, Barack Obama raised a record amount of money for a candidate, about $745 million. He became the first candidate to reject the modern system of public financing of presidential elections. Instead, he accepted smaller contributions from hundreds of thousands of supporters. His campaign made extensive use of the internet to collect donations, connect with voters, and organize volunteers. John McCain did not have as much money to spend. Something else also set him apart from the Democratic nominee. John McCain supported the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Barack Obama said he would bring the troops home from Iraq within two years of becoming president. But the top issue in the campaign was the economy. Again, Larry Sabato at the University of Virginia. The fundamental issue in most presidential elections is the economy. It really is the economy, stupid. The old slogan from the 1992 Clinton campaign. When an administration has a positive, strong economy, they're tough to beat, even if it's uh, a non-incumbent running. But when the economy turns sour, they're halfway out the door. Barack Obama and John McCain agreed on at least one thing in dealing with the economy. They both supported President Bush's call for the government to bail out the financial industry. Many Americans disliked the idea of helping banks that had acted irresponsibly. But Congress agreed to let the government buy bad loans from banks and temporarily become part owner of some rescued companies. Supporters argued that the bailouts were needed to save the economy from collapse. In November of 2008, Americans elected Barack Hussein Obama as their 44th president. He received 53% of the popular vote. He won some states that had not chosen a Democrat in many years. A little more than 60% of voting age Americans cast their ballots, the highest percentage since 1964. Support for Barack Obama was especially strong among young people and African Americans. Many voters were emotional on election night. I'm speechless. I'm trying not to cry right now. I'm thinking of my great grandfather, my grandmother. And man, this is, is amazing. Because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. But the election of 2008 was not the end of America's economic problems. What became known as the Great Recession would officially end in June of 2009, six months into the new president's term. But its lasting effects would continue to be felt all the way into the 2012 election season. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.